as we're walking through the Christ-honoring church and really building a statement, a theology of the church that will be our foundation, Lord willing, for many, many years to come. A couple of weeks ago, before Resurrection Sunday, on Sunday evening, we preached on prayer in the church, and we spent the last number of minutes in prayer together, and we're going to do that again tonight. We'll spend the last 10, 15 minutes of our service together in prayer. We'll, we'll gather up, and I will give you a topic or two for us to pray together about, and then we'll close it out with a song together, but I wanted you to know that was coming, and looking forward to that as well. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. While you're finding Romans 6, this morning we read from Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Tonight, we're going to address the topic of baptism. And I specifically and purposefully put this right after the topic of the gospel this morning because baptism is what necessarily follows the gospel. Now, just a little side note. I keep records of when I address certain topics. And so I look back, and I've addressed this in 2018, and I addressed a longer version just a couple of years ago in 2022, and I thought, this is a little soon to do that again, but I counted, and I've preached 180 messages between that time and this time, so hopefully you've forgotten some of it. But I know I've never addressed baptism in the larger context of a theology of the church, the doctrine of the church. I don't, I almost never like to present something from the same angle twice, and so I generally look through things I've done before, and I, I, I try to find a different angle, but I had two challenges First of all, baptism is so fundamental to the church that there's not much about it you can change. There isn't a different angle. It, uh, creativity runs the risk of missing some of the necessary basics. And then honestly, as I reviewed what we presented before, I really liked it. And I thought, I think we need to hear this again. So if you, if this is so familiar to you that you're mouthing words with me, that's great. That means you've got the topic down. But I want to look at baptism from a couple of different angles. First of all, we need to defend how baptism happens and and why it happens. And then also, we want to look at really the the spiritual basis for it. We'll be in Romans 6 here in a bit. But just a little history. At the beginning of the Great Reformation, when the true gospel of salvation by faith alone and Christ alone is revealed in the scriptures alone, as the gospel was spreading across Europe, in total opposition to the Roman Catholic theology of salvation by works, during this time, the issue of baptism was huge, particularly the mode or the method of baptism. It was a hot topic in the day. When the reformers led people away from the heresy of Roman Catholicism, almost all Catholic practices were changed, but infant baptism continued for the most part. It just kind of held over. There were much bigger issues to deal with, and so that one wasn't dealt with at a high level. The idea of baptizing only those who made a profession of faith in Christ was actually considered radical and pretty dangerous. At the beginning of the Reformation, a group emerged that was nicknamed by their opponents the Anabaptists, the re-baptizers, they were called. They believed that the Bible taught that true water baptism was only for professing believers in Christ, and so it couldn't be for infants. Now, if you've never been around a Presbyterian church or been around Presbyterians, you might think, why is this a big deal? This is a big deal. You, as someone who believes, or I hope believes, in believer's baptism, you're in the minority, for the most part, among Reformed folks. In Zurich, Switzerland, under the spiritual leadership of Ulrich Zwingli, the city council, and keep in mind, during the Reformation, the government, local government, and the church were one and the same, that they were, they were in lockstep together. Whatever the, the government decided is what the church had to do, what the church decided, the government went with it. And so 
Under the spiritual leadership of Zwingli, the city council felt that the Anabaptists were promoting changes too quickly. And so on January 21st, 1525, the council voted to forbid the Anabaptists from teaching their views of believers' baptism. Because of this, and continued insistence by the Anabaptists to practice believers' baptism, in a decree in 1526, Zwingli and the Zurich City Council voted to condemn the local Anabaptists to death. To make their point, the city council executed the Anabaptists by drowning them. Zwingli is still an important part of the Reformation. That was a lapse in judgment, to say the least. The Reformers were flawed men. But many of the Anabaptists fled to other parts of Europe and continued to be persecuted by both Catholics and Protestants alike. But many still died for this belief. In the Netherlands in 1566, 3,000 Anabaptists were executed in one mass execution. So the issue of water baptism isn't just a, a theological discussion at Starbucks. Lives have been at stake. Lives have been lost over this issue, thousands of them. Now in our time, in our culture, you probably won't face that type of intense need to take a side. Nobody's going to put a gun to your head and say, which type of baptism do you hold to? Answer carefully. That's probably not going to happen. But we do face other challenges. Let me give you two of them. The first one, there's the challenge of indifference toward baptism. This indifference toward baptism, I blame solely and only on elders and pastors in a local church. Because they will insist that True believers are baptized. They don't track church membership. And then they engender a culture of baptism as being some sort of emotional show of I love Jesus and it's, that it's optional. It's not optional. And so there's a challenge of indifference. There's also the challenge of abuse of baptism. The abuse of baptism is when baptism is used as a tool of Satan to give false assurance of salvation our practice here of having baptism candidates write out and process through their salvation testimony and then publicly give that testimony, that's actually quite unusual in evangelicalism today. Most baptism services you could attend just ask one question, do you profess Jesus as your savior? Some are even worse. Do you believe in Jesus? I think about James who says even the demons believe in Jesus. There's nothing inherently wrong with that simple question but the fact is, the vast majority of people I have personally baptized have already been baptized prior to genuine salvation. That fact alone, to me, is witness to the lackadaisical approach to the holy waters of baptism. And, and I, I like it when people say, well, I, I wasn't saved when I was baptized, so I need to be baptized again. And I always like to say, well, you're not actually being baptized again because you weren't baptized before. If you're not saved, all you did was get wet in a religious setting. That's it. It's not baptism unless you're saved. And so I want to walk through this, and there are some facts we need to do because theology is important. And so I divided our time into, into four parts. I want to do the basics of baptism, the participants of baptism, the method of baptism, and the purpose of baptism. Or if you want to use shorter words, uh, the basics is what, participants is who, the method is how, and the purpose is why. So first, the basics of baptism. I want to start with a, a simple definition. Baptism is a post-salvation act of faith and public testimony, and I'll repeat this. Baptism is a post-salvation act of faith and public testimony that you have been united with Christ in his death. That you have been united with Christ in his death and resurrection and intend to follow and obey him. Baptism is a post-salvation act of faith and public testimony that you have been united with Christ in his death and resurrection and intend to follow and obey him. And to get us going and just to give us kind of a spiritual foundation, the starting point, I want to use Romans chapter 6. Now to be clear, the text is not talking about water baptism. It's using the broader metaphor of baptize simply mean to be completely plunged into something, into a new state of being. Water baptism is the outward demonstration of the internal reality, which has already happened. And 
That's the internal reality Paul's describing in Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been justified from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death is no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so the baptism that Paul is speaking of here is the close identification, the union with Christ, union in his death, union in his resurrection, to be baptized, to be absorbed, to be uh, completely soaked by something or into something. It is total association. And so that's why he uses the metaphor of baptism. And that's why the symbol needs to accurately represent that. Now, in understanding the basics of water baptism... We have to eliminate two things water baptism is not. And this is a frequent question I get as a pastor. First of all, baptism is not proof of salvation. It is not proof of salvation. Traditional evangelicalism often boasts of how many baptisms were performed in a given month or a given year because water baptism is seen as proof of salvation, as notches in the belt, so to speak. This is extremely dangerous because instead of looking at the fruit of salvation, In the life of the professing believer, many simply point back to one event as proof that I'm a Christian, that all is right with God. That can actually be an eternally fatal error. Second thing, baptism is not, it is not an act of salvation. It's not proof of salvation, nor is it an act of salvation. We talked about this a bit this morning. This is belief is called baptismal regeneration. Roman Catholics, many Lutherans, Greek and Russian Orthodox hold a baptismal regeneration. It speaks of being cleansed of sin because of baptism, and that is not accurate. In fact, the Egyptian Orthodox Church openly says, quote, baptism is a holy sacrament by which we are born again. This belief that while their baptism is simply an act apart from any faith which saves is completely not biblical. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And this, not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So baptism is a good thing, but if you believe it saves you, it becomes a work, and that's a bad thing. In fact, we have to address this. Many in that fatal belief system of baptismal regeneration point to 1 Peter 3, 21 I, I personally, I don't think it's a good policy to base eternities on one verse. I, I'd rather go through the whole Bible, but they do point to this verse. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. And they go, aha. And remember, we've already said this, the concept of baptism doesn't necessarily have exclusively a water context. It simply means to be identified or taken into or immersed into something. In fact, the context is that Peter just said that Noah was saved in the ark, that Noah was associated with, in, a part of the ark which saved him. And in the same way, we are in Christ who saves us. So baptism is not proof of salvation, nor is it an act of salvation. And it's dangerous to think either of those as being true. So let's spend some time on the participants in baptism. Who can be baptized? And like I mentioned, thousands of people have died over this. The major debate occurs between paedo-baptists and credo-baptists, or simpler words, those who believe infant baptism, paedo-baptists, and credo-baptists, those who believe in a statement of faith or a creed. Uh, 
is necessary for salvation. And so I'm going to take a detour here for a bit because we need to clarify our position because it is a big deal. There's a, a church in town that just switched from uh, believer's baptism to infant baptism. And so it's, it's having an effect even in our city. I want to give what I hope is a fair treatment of infant baptism. Pado baptism, infant baptism was the position of pretty much all the original reformers and many, many great men of God in our era. Basically, Pado baptism says that infant children of believers, the babies that believers have, they're often called covenant children, that they should be baptized. They argue that since God's redemptive plan has continuity throughout history, in the Old Testament, God instituted the sign of circumcision to be applied to male infants. It didn't save them, but it marked them out as a part of God's covenant people. And so, Pado baptists uh, they, they equate or they connect circumcision to baptism. It's a mark of covenant membership, marking the child out as part of God's covenant people. The concept of infant baptism is rooted in the belief that the primary way that the church has grown throughout the centuries is through the young people who are raised in the church. And that's a wonderful concept. Dr. Joel Beakey the preeminent scholar on the Puritans, he wrote this, Reformed Christians have acknowledged that their most solid, genuine church growth has been through the conversion of youth reared in the church. Spurgeon agreed with this. Charles Spurgeon said that in his estimation over his years in the ministry, the children saved in the church under the preaching of the true and biblical gospel, he said, quote, have been more numerously genuine than any other class, more constant, and in the long run, more solid. Dr. Beakey also states that, quote, God ordinarily works savingly among his covenantal seed. That means Christians. And so in this view, those who are covenant children, those children born in a household of at least one professing Christian who have been baptized as infants and are raised in the church under the prayers and the preaching of the church with the great hope of their eventual salvation in Christ, that they are headed towards salvation with a tremendous amount of certainty. Not 100% certainty, but a lot of certainty. Now, this belief is based on several scriptures, which I'll give to you, and I'm trying to give a fair treatment here, but one scripture in particular, and I'll end with that one. They would use Genesis 17, 7. This is the establishment of the covenant relationship to God with the children of God's people. God is speaking to Abraham, and he says, and I will establish my covenant between you, between me and you and your seed after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. They also use Acts 2, 39. For the promises for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. But the primary text for the idea of covenant children comes from 1 Corinthians 7, 14. It says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. This is the key verse for the concept of covenant children, which then extends to infant baptism. And, and this is important, covenant children are to be called to a life of holiness, a lifestyle set apart from the world even prior to salvation. Now, from my anecdotal experience, for what it's worth, I would agree that given 100 Christian couples and 100 non-Christian couples, the odds are that many, many more children in the Christian families will be saved. Is that a cause and effect or is that correlation though? I would say it's correlation because that can also be attributed to the fact that those 100 Christian couples are presenting the gospel to their children. And the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Now, to be fair, Dr. Beakey states this, and this is a true statement. Scripture offers no guarantees for the salvation of our children. That part is true. Then he goes on to say, but the covenant of grace offers us a great deal of hope outside of ourselves and a sovereign covenant-keeping God who will not forsake the works of his own hands. We would agree that scripture offers no guarantee for the salvation of our children. All of our hope for the salvation of our precious ones is in God and God alone. We would agree on that. And I would also say, to be fair, that the, 
the motivation, the heart desire behind infant baptism is the eventual salvation of that child. The belief that baptism is one of the means of grace to move that child along toward actual regeneration. And in fact, to those who believe in infant baptism, warn against overestimating the value of infant baptism. In other words, while they would say that this places a child in covenant relationship with God, it's not a replacement for regeneration. It's not a replacement for conversion later in life. And in fact, they caution parents against presuming that their children are saved because of infant baptism. Now, one other note that's used to build the case for infant baptism is the baptism of whole households in the book of Acts. Pado baptists argue from instances in the New Testament of a person being baptized along with his household, Cornelius, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, Crispus, uh, Stephanus in 1 Corinthians 2. And so that would be uh, part of their uh, proof. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Our dear Presbyterian brothers and sisters who hold the idea of covenant children and their logical conclusion of infant baptism, generally speaking, they can be characterized as believing the biblical gospel. They have a massive desire to see children of believers saved. And so we're in total lockstep with them on that. And that's important to point that out. But we need to deal with what the Bible says, not with what a theological system tells us to believe. And so respectfully, I want to offer some critiques just so that you know why you believe what you believe, and then we'll move on to what we might call believer's baptism. I want to just give you a few critiques, if you think eight is a few. First of all, we'll call this one the high road critique. The high road critique says that there can be the implication that those who hold the infant baptism are actually more concerned for the salvation of children than those who do do not hold the infant baptism. I, I've had a paleo baptist say, don't you care about the salvation of the kids in your church? You should be baptizing them. That was a bitter pill to swallow. Of course we care about the salvation of the kids in our church. Some, not all, but some proponents of infant baptism would say that those who do not baptize infants are less concerned about the gospel. It's not provable and it's not true. There's a second critique I'll call the authoritative critique. The authoritative critique. I'm always suspicious of anything that can't be understood from the Bible without church authority. The average Christian reading the Bible is not going to come to the conclusion of infant baptism. That's my opinion. This has to be taught through a system of theology which essentially equates Israel and the church and makes all of Israel's promises now for the church. And then you take some really daring and pretty tenuous interpretations of just two or three verses and interpret that toward infant baptism. The average believer in Christ is not going to come to the conclusion of infant baptism without significant help from pastors and complex theological arguments and studies which show that the Bible might hint at infant baptism. I would have to say that if something is completely and utterly a mystery until a PhD theologian explains it to you, I'm prone to be suspicious of that thing because I believe in the clarity of Scripture, the plainness of Scripture, the understandability of Scripture. Here's a third critique. I'll call it the continuity critique. The continuity critique. A large part of the view of infant baptism is based on the continuity, supposedly, between circumcision in the Old Testament and infant baptism. And there's actually very little continuity, except that they both happen to babies. That's it. Circumcision is a very Jewish sign of the Abrahamic covenant, so much so that Jews in the New Testament are often called those of the circumcision. But circumcision was part of the law of Moses. That law expired at the cross. And so finding continuity between circumcision and baptism is only possible if you want it to be there in the first place through your theological system. Fourth critique we'll call the scriptural critique of covenant children. I'm going to take a moment on this because the Bible is clear. The scriptural critique of covenant ch children says this, there is no clear Bible study or hermeneutical thread to stand on. 
Infant baptism is inferred. It's assumed based on trying to walk a tightrope that's made out of a spider's web. It's very, very weak. Remember, covenant children, those children born in the household of at least one professing Christian who have been baptized as infants and are raised in the church under the prayers and the preaching of the church with the great hope of their eventual salvation in Christ. That's how they would define a covenant child. But let's return to the main scriptures that are used to support infant baptism. Genesis 17, 7. God is speaking to Abraham. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. We would agree that God is going to bless the physical offspring of Abraham, Israel, and the spiritual descendants of Abraham, which includes Gentiles who believe on Christ. But that means that there are covenant children who will go to hell. And by the way, those who believe in infant baptism agree with this. I have a hard time calling somebody part of a covenant with God who is going to end up with an eternity in hell. By the way, it's a huge stretch from God's covenant to Abraham to baptizing infants. I I read an entire book that outlines the way to get there. And I had to read it twice to try to figure it out. And I finally figured out why I can't figure it out because it doesn't make sense. Like I said, it's like a tightrope made of a spider's web. How about Acts 2.39? For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Let me reemphasize. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. This is in Peter's Pentecost sermon. First of all, this is partly a quote from Isaiah 57, which states that not only will Jews be saved by faith, but Gentiles will be saved by faith as well. That's the main point. Secondly, this ignores the common biblical use of children to simply mean your descendants. If you're 90 years old and you have 65-year-old kids, what do you call them? My children. It doesn't have to speak of actual children. The third problem is it ignores, it ignores the distinction between the church and Israel. And so again, you have this huge leap to in, infant baptism. But the primary text for covenant children 1 Corinthians 7, 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband for otherwise your children are unclean but now they are holy. This is the key verse. This is, this is the bedrock. This is the foundation. Let me give you two major problems with this though. One is contextual and one is logical. The contextual problem, the, the context here is not Paul teaching about covenant children. That's a term that's made up, by the way. That's made up by theologians. The context is helping a believing spouse married to an unbeliever know what to do. Something as hugely important as the so-called fact of covenant children would not be tucked away into a passage that's teaching something else altogether. So there's a contextual problem. There's a logical problem as well. And this one is very convincing. First of all, what does it mean that the children are made holy? What does that mean? It simply means that the children in a household with even one believing parent uh, receive the spiritual impact, the benefits of that believing parent. It's far more beneficial, infinitely better for a child to be raised in a household with at least one believing mom or believing dad than in a completely non-Christian home. But beyond that, the belief in covenant children, and I'm really trying to represent their view accurately says that because 1 Corinthians 7.14 says that the child of even one unbelieving parent and one believing parent is a covenant child, then that child should be baptized as an infant because of this covenant relationship with God. Why do they say this? Because the verse says that the children are holy, hagias, set apart. Therefore, they should be baptized. Here's the logical problem. The verse says also that the unbelieving husband and the unbelieving wife is sanctified, hagias, holy. What does that mean? Well, by logic, the unbelieving husband ought to be baptized as well. The unbelieving wife ought to be baptized. What does it mean that the unbeliever is sanctified, made holy? It means that he ought to thank God that he's married to a believing wife. 
because he has a gospel influence literally under his roof every single day. That's what it means that he's set apart. So the logic doesn't hold. By that logic, we ought to baptize all the unbelievers. That doesn't hold at all. Let me give you a, a, another critique, and this is one that concerns me. I'll call this one the confusion critique, and the confusion is with the children. Covenant children are called to a life of holiness and a lifestyle set apart from the world prior to salvation. Now, I would submit that an unsaved person of any age cannot live a life of holiness. Godly parents can protect their kids from the world, and rightly so, disciplining them, setting limits for them. But I would always stop short of telling a little child, you are a covenant child and you must live a life of holiness. That comes dangerously close to a perverted gospel, doesn't it? To confusing that child. And I've spoken to adults, I have baptized adults who were raised this way, who said they were always confused, that they were told that they were baptized and so they needed to live holy lives before even being saved. And so in this system, children are taught that outward obedience is part of the covenantal relationship to God and yet also taught that that outward obedience falls short of obligation to God. So it's very confusing for a little kid. Joel Beakey writes, we must teach our covenant children and young people to plead with our covenant God on the basis of his promises to baptize them with the spirit of grace and to grant them regeneration, repentance, and faith. I'm all for telling children to pray to God for regeneration and for mercy. We, we had all of our kids pray for salvation. But to tell them to plead on the basis of cloudy and indistinct promises can send the message to the child, listen carefully, can send the message that God is obligated to save them. And that's not the gospel. Here's a sixth critique. I'll call it the presumption critique. The presumption critique, there's no example in the Bible of infant baptism, not one. Pado baptists argue that whole households are baptized, Cornelius, Lydia, Philippian jailer, and so forth. But none of those texts say that the, that the members of the household were baptized only because they were members of the household. The evidence points to household conversions leading to baptism. And of course, it never says there were infants in those houses. So the belief of infants in the household, that's a presumption only. There's a seventh critique. I call it the command critique. The command critique. We read earlier, Matthew 28, Jesus was very clear that you baptize converts, that you baptize disciples, you baptize believers. Uh, this is, I think, a reasonable question. If infant baptism is that obedient, that important, rather, to obey the Lord, why is there not one single direct command anywhere in Scripture to baptize newborn children? And on top of that, now you're holding me accountable to supposedly obey God when in fact you can't point to one clear command. Not one. That smells to me of spiritual elitism. I don't think that's the intention, but that is definitely the effect. So what is the pattern in scripture? Who may be baptized? Those who have already experienced the new birth on the basis of their faith, they have repented They've demonstrated active faith and obedience. Acts 2, the 3,000 that came to faith on Pentecost. Acts 8, the Ethiopian who believed on Christ. Acts 9, the Apostle Paul. Acts 10, Cornelius and his household. Acts 16, Lydia. Acts 16, the Philippian jailer. And, and so, of course, we want to fence. We want to protect baptism. We're not just going to baptize anyone. So how do we know that someone has experienced the new birth? And there's no way to know for certain, but we guard baptism in a couple of ways. We receive a testimony of conversion, life before, life after Christ. We ask for an explanation of the gospel. Why do we do that? It's not very likely someone's a believer in Christ when they can't articulate why they're a believer in Christ. The basics of the gospel. Let me give you one more critique. It's, it's less important, but I think it's important nevertheless. And that is the historical critique. The historical critique, now history doesn't prove theology, but it does show who believed what. So I'll just go through a little list here. The Didache, which is the, the first major Christian publication during the first century on Christian living, it teaches post-conversion baptism. The Letter of Barnabas around 120 AD teaches post-conversion baptism. 
Early church fathers such as Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Hippolytus, Cyprian of Carthage, just to name a few, all believed in believers' baptism. And none of these ever one time mentions the idea of infant baptism. And in fact, in those writings, there's a tendency to emphasize tremendous spiritual preparation for baptism, a a tremendous weightiness to it. Tertullian, around 200 AD, instructed this, thusly, when we are going to enter the water in the presence of the congregation and under the hand of the president, that's what they call the lead elder, we solemnly profess that we disown the devil, his pomp, and his angels. Justin Martyr, in his work, Dialogue with Trypho, he instructed that to be baptized, you must be, quote, eagerly looking for salvation, believe in God, become acquainted with the Christ of God. In other words, there's a yearning in your heart. The letter of Barnabas states, blessed are they who, placing their trust in the cross, have gone down into the water. The Didache, in fact, instructs that the baptism candidate was to fast for one or two days prior because it was such a big deal. And so the participants in baptism are those who have professed faith in Christ and committed to follow him. The pattern in scripture, generally speaking, is that baptism follows certain conversion to Christ. I could do the next part quickly, but I want you to understand why you believe what you believe. I want to talk about the method of baptism or the mode. There's two parts to it. Very simple. By immersion and publicly. That's it. First, by immersion, sometimes called the mode of baptism. The Greek word we translate baptize simply means to immerse or to dip. The word can have, as we said, uh, non-water uses. For example, John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, 11, that those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, immersed in, identified with, and those who do not believe in the Lord will be baptized with fire, immersed in, and identified with the judgment of God. The word baptized doesn't allow for any other meaning except immersion. In 1813, David Benedict wrote a book about the history of Baptists, and he wrote about the mode, the method of baptism in history. And he said, baptism, as it was instituted by the great Christian lawgiver, that's Christ, was a plain and significant rite. But in process of time, baptism passed from visible believers to catechized minors and from then to unconscious babies. And from immersion, it was reduced to pouring, then to sprinkling, and now to any mode which the inventive fancies of capricious candidates may devise, provided always that some part of them get wet. Translation, we don't get to just make up how we baptize. This was important enough to us that we spent tens of thousands of dollars on a baptistry. We could have spent 50 cents on a squirt gun. But we're going to obey the Lord. When imperial persecution drove Christians in Rome literally underground, where the term underground church comes from is they went under the ground. They went into the catacombs of Rome and secret baptistries were constructed The remains of those baptistries are some of the oldest archaeological witnesses to how Christian baptism was performed. A church historian named George Rice wrote this, one such baptistry in the catacomb of San Ponziano is four and a half feet long, three and a half feet wide, and three and a half feet deep. A channel diverted water from a nearby stream to fill this fountain. It was in use from the first to the fourth century. And so it is by immersion. The second means, second method, is in public. It is in public. We have a personal faith. We do not have a private faith. Our faith in Christ is not private. Anyone who says, my faith in God is really just between me and him, translation, I'm not really a Christian. That's what that means. If someone says he decided to baptize himself in his bathtub all alone, He didn't get baptized. He just took a bath in a state of religious contemplation. That's it. Baptism is always a public profession with other believers in the context of the church, meaning the proper gathering of the church. Doesn't matter where it is, at a river or a lake or someone's swimming pool, it is the gathering of the church. If someone says, I'm too embarrassed to get dunked underwater in front of a bunch of people, I would say, then you're too embarrassed to follow Christ. Now, 
As a younger man, I was frustrated as I began learning the doctrine of baptism that I was raised in an environment that didn't understand Christian baptism. I I received as a gift from my mother years ago, and I don't have it anymore for obvious reasons, the christening robe that I was christened in. The thing was beautiful. I was the most beautiful little girl, apparently, in the whole world. It's white and decorative and flowy and absolutely meaningless. It's caused a lot of angst and even a little bit frustration for a lot of you at being misled, but whatever stage you're in, now you know. Now you know the truth. So the how do we baptize question is not complicated by immersion and in public. But let's get to the heart of the issue. What is the purpose of baptism? I want to give you four reasons for baptism, but you really only need one but I'll give you the other three as kind of a bonus. Reason number one, it is a command of Christ. That's enough, right there. We've already read Matthew 18, or Matthew 28, rather. Jesus Christ was not ambiguous. Believers in Christ are baptized. If you don't want to follow the very first command of Christ, why would the church have any reason to believe you want to follow any of the other commands of Christ? Jesus was very clear. He said, if you love him, you obey his commandments, and he commanded baptism. Here's the second reason. I've already alluded to this, but I want to flesh it out. Baptism publicly identifies you as a follower of Christ. It publicly identifies you as a follower of Christ. And I want to give you five ways baptism shows you to be a follower of Christ. The first one we would call association. Association. Jesus commanded his disciples Matthew 28, 19, to baptize new disciples in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. This is a public statement of belief in the triune God and the desire to associate with him. By the way, lots of ancient churches, and some still do this, uh, dip you three times in the name of the Father. Up, oh, And I just don't have the strength to do that anymore, so we do it all in one shot. And some will say it while you're under the water. In the name of the Father, back up. And we, we're trying to send you to heaven, apparently. An association. Here's another way baptism identifies you as a follower of Christ. Identification. Identification. We've already referenced Romans 6 where we're buried with Christ. We're raised with Christ. The Apostle Paul illustrates this by referring to the believers being in Christ 85 times. And it's a beautiful illustration. Baptism is a monumental statement that we are in Christ. Here's a third way that baptism shows you to be a follower Purification. Purification. Baptism is not a means of purification, but it's a representative act of the cleansing of sin as part of the new covenant. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Association, identification, purification, liberation. Liberation is the fourth way you show yourself to be a follower of Christ. Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but now we're liberated. The wrath of God holds no fear for you. There's no terror for you. And then incorporation. Incorporation. 1 Corinthians 12.13 states that in one spirit, we have all been baptized into one body and made to drink of one spirit. Now, that's speaking primarily of the work of the Holy Spirit in officially incorporating you into the body of Christ. But water baptism is a public statement of incorporation into the church. There's a third reason for baptism. Baptism is evidence of commitment to Christ. It's evidence of commitment to Christ. Not proof, but evidence. Evidence to those in the church that commitment to Christ is genuine. Let me put it to you this way. Baptism is the simplest thing Christ will ever ask you to do. It is the very simplest. Isn't it nice that the very first thing he asks you to do as a believer is easy and you don't even have to do anything? You just step into the water and someone else baptizes you. 1 John 2, 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. The older I've gotten, the more I've been in the ministry when somebody says, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to be baptized. I said, then you're not a Christian. There's no way... We're going to affirm your faith if the very simplest thing Christ asks you to do, you don't want to do it. 
Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not a proof text for baptismal regeneration. Remember, the church is being birthed all at one time here at the day of Pentecost. But this is a spiritual environment on the day of Pentecost when their own leaders had just executed Jesus less than two months earlier. Peter is essentially saying, do you really want to follow Christ? Are you really repentant? And are you willing to count the cost? Then make it public and make it official. Be baptized as a follower of Christ. And very shortly thereafter, most of the believers in Jerusalem were persecuted and they had to run for their lives. And how did the Jewish officials know who to persecute? The ones who were publicly baptized. Baptism in the early church was to take your life into your own hands. It meant Christ before Caesar. Emperor Decius, in the mid-third century, he loathed Christians. And he loathed them so much that rather than just killing them, he tried to get them to turn away from Christ. He tried to get them to forsake their faith. They were tortured, they were threatened, some were even bribed, offered money. Decius commanded that all Roman citizens had to sacrifice to the traditional Roman gods, and then and only then would they be given an official certificate that they had obeyed this order. In fact, this was, this was kind of a mark that you were okay with the emperor, and early theologians thought that might have been kind of the mark of the beast sort of a thing. One certificate, called in Latin a libellus, was discovered in Egypt, and it said this, The edict of Decius in the year 250 commanded provincial governors and magistrates assisted where necessary by local notables to superintend the sacrifices to the gods and to the genius of the emperor to be performed by all citizens on a fixed day. In that environment, a professing Christian who refused to be baptized wasn't given the time of day by the church, and rightly so. They would say, then you're not a Christian because you're not standing with us. Here's a fourth reason for baptism. Baptism is directly connected to membership in the local church. And I've alluded to this, but I want to spend some time on it. Acts 2.41, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, rather, and to the prayers. I want you to notice several things what I just read. First of all, someone counted how many people were baptized. Why? They're keeping track of who the members are of the new church. That's how they kept track. The second thing I'd have you notice, what did all the baptized people do? They immediately gathered together and submitted to the leaders of the church, at that time, the apostles. And the third thing I'd have you notice, they took the Lord's Supper together only as baptized members. They were very clear about that. Once in a while, I'll get an email or a, or a phone call from somebody in the community saying, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my kids and their, their spiritual state, and I was wondering if I could have you baptize them, like I'm sort of like a rented chaplain or something kind of a thing. And I always say, no, because if, you, if we baptize your kids, they're joining our church. Oh, I don't want to join the church. We just want to be baptized. Then you don't want to come to Christ. The two are connected. The concept of baptizing someone who makes no commitment to join a local assembly of Christians is unknown in the Bible. Now, by the way, just in case you might be wondering about this, baptism is a one-time event in the life of a Christian, so we receive new members who have publicly proclaimed their faith in another local church, but baptism is in the church. It's not at a family gathering. It's not at a barbecue. It's in the gathering of the church with duly qualified elders in attendance and organizing. So let me finish by asking one question and making one plea. On occasion, I'm asked, oh, no, are we Baptists? When we're building the baptistry here, we're like, hey, we're going backwards here. Are are we Baptists? Eventually, to put a label on everything you believe gets ridiculous because you'd have to have pages of labels. I think it's a legitimate question. Are we Baptists? Because we're an independent Bible church and people say, well, what are you? Like, well, I don't really know. Actually, I'm just a Christian. So are we Baptists? Well, let's walk through this. First of all, we are reformed in that we hold to the doctrines of grace. The salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone is revealed, and the scriptures alone 
to the glory of God alone, so are we Reformed Baptists? Well, let's see. Reformed Baptists, sometimes called particular Baptists or Calvinistic Baptists, they hold the Reformed doctrines of grace. Check that one off. They hold to the regulative principles of worship that since the Bible does not command infant baptism, we don't practice that. So we check that one off. They hold to covenant theology, that God made a covenant of works with Adam, a covenant of grace with his elect people. Uncheck, because we would graciously disagree with our covenantal brethren, because scripture doesn't explicitly teach either a covenant of works or a covenant of grace. Those are not named in scripture. We believe that all scripture means what it means when it was written and still means the same thing now. What God commanded to Abraham meant the same thing then as it does now. So sometimes that's called being dispensational. By the way, Reformed Baptists often consider dispensational Baptists as those who have abandoned the true Reformed faith. So what are we? I guess we would call ourselves Reformed Dispensational Baptists, I suppose. So why don't we put Grace Reformed Dispensational Baptist? Because three people driving by would know what that means. It wouldn't mean anything. And if we're really trying to define ourselves by our label or our name, it can get ridiculous. So here's what should go on our sign, I suppose. That we would be grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone, literal, historical, grammatical, hermeneutic, premillennial, pre-tribulational, dispensational, believer's baptism, six-day creationist, not under the law of Moses, new covenant, still under Abrahamic covenant, literal restoration of Israel, but Gentiles are coming into the kingdom in church age, harmony of the gospels, Trinitarian reformed, regulative principle in worship, Calvinist, but don't be offended by that because we still love you, church. <laughs> so I think Grace Bible Church is good enough. I think we can live with that. But more importantly, I have a plea. And I know this might be someone in this room. Do not point to your baptism as your proof of salvation. Don't point to your baptism as a proof of salvation. Don't let the fact that you've been baptized keep you from examining your heart. Paul told the leaders in the Corinthian church, examine yourselves, test yourselves to see if you were in the faith. You know what they all had in common? They were all baptized. Have you been following Christ in a way that demonstrates a changed life? Or are you hanging on to that moment of baptism as your single source of assurance of salvation? Don't let your baptism make you relax and think that even with your double life that God has redeemed you. This is what theologians call easy believism. And it's dangerous. It's radically dangerous. So the plea is very simple. This morning we talked about the gospel Come to the cross. Tonight we talked about baptism. Come to the waters. The waters of baptism are holy. They're sweet. They're pure. They're delightful because they represent what Christ has done for us. I'm going to pray and then just for a moment as we did a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to ask when I say so that you just gather in groups of three, four, five, six, seven, eight of you maybe and just for maybe 10 minutes, I'd like to return to our theme this morning, the gospel and the lost. And I would like to ask that in your groups, you pray intently that the Lord would bring the lost to us and that we would save them and that we're running the water in this thing every other week, whatever it takes. I told you the story this morning of the young man, Archibald Brown, who took this little church that seats 800 and just barely had a few dozen members and they prayed and they prayed for new converts. And God saved 70 men in one night. And the same God who did that then in 1867 can do it in 2024. And so I'm gonna pray briefly and then I'll ask you to gather together in groups just for a few minutes and then we'll close just by singing a familiar hymn together. So let me pray and then we'll gather. Our Father, we come to you now. It's, it's been a glorious Lord's Day, and it's a long day. It's a good day. It's a sweet time together. And so, Lord, we thank you, first of all, for the gospel. We thank you for baptism, which represents the work of Christ in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would save those in our midst who have clung to baptism as their single source of assurance. 
We pray, Lord, that you would graciously help us as we witness Christ to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our children, to our parents, that you would bring many into these doors to hear the gospel and that we would see the flowing waters of baptism. We would see our little baptistry filled up many times representing the work of the Holy Spirit in what you are doing. Lord, thank you for this Lord's Day. It's been a glorious day. I pray you would bless us now as we just take the the last few minutes to devote to speaking to you as this little church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.